My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. Hey, how are you? My name is Ben, and I am a movie buff. I am one part video game nerd, one part comic book nerd, but all parts movie nerd. Our mission is to bring nerd culture to the masses by putting it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Bat Jar, Jar Podcast. Podcast. Movies, TV, manga, comic books, or is that graphic novels, cartoons, groups, that's animation, Disney, Star Wars, Dragon Ball Z, no. Pokemon, and Digimon, Pow. and Mighty Morphin, Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Pow. Yogi-Yo, and Nintendo, Cinematic Universe, Marvel, DC, Justice League, is Batman, Jones, with Superman, Flash, Wonder Woman, Avengers, Iron Man, Captain, Chopper, Loki, Spider-Man, and Hulk, and Logan, X-Men, Thunder, Zelda, Galaxy, Guardians, Star Trek, Trick, Trick, Card, and Jane, Guardians, and Geeks, and Gather, Rock, and Jordan, and the Big Bang Shark. Hello there, and welcome to the Bat Jar Podcast, where we put nerd culture under the microscope. Tika, and just in, any, just in case anyone was wondering, in Maori, that uh, translates to, that's right. And if you might be wondering, why am I talking in Maori, you'll learn soon enough. Yeah, so Ben the Movie Buff, you're back. Yeah, man. How's it going? Uh, I got some fire this morning on Facebook from my uh, youngest brother, King Boo, for our Harry Potter episode last week. Okay. He, he uh, apparently, I... I don't know if you listened to our episode last week about Harry Potter. Not yet. But I, I basically had a lot of complaints about how the wizarding world is set up. Okay. And according to my brother, King Boo, yep. and if anyone else feels as frustrated with the podcast as him, you know, we were just going off of our own knowledge and our own opinions. So if, if we're ignorant of the complexities of the wizarding world, I apologize. <laughs> you know, we were just kind of sharing our own opinions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But King Boo insists that there is an explanation for every kind of plot hole or issue i had with the wizarding world now to l- l- just to to clear up here uh when you're talking about the wizarding world you're talking about the attraction like the, the no the like the actual like the wizarding in world in the oh okay yeah. okay so i was like commenting on how like why in the 20th century are the wizarding wor- you know the wizards and the normal people separated from each other still right and like why do they stop teaching kids certain subjects once they get to the age of 11 mm-hmm. so Anyway, apparently there's an answer <laughs> to all of that. So for anyone okay. who was triggered by last week's episode, yep. now you know how I feel every time I hear people try and talk about superheroes. So welcome to my world. Yeah, and, and to be fair, let's remember as well that uh, if you were to take like the thousands of pages that make the seven Harry Potter books and then and then you have like the eight Harry Potter movies, I would imagine in most cases when you do a book to movie translation or adaptation, there's always going to be more information and more to learn about in the books than there are in the actual movies, right? Case in point, The Order of the Phoenix book I think is the longest book of the series, but when it comes to the movies, it's actually one of the shorter movies, meaning that there's a lot of stuff that they cut out from the book. So there might be lots of insight about how certain thing work, uh, certain things work. Like I remember my brother telling me once how apparently... Uh, in the movies, you see Dumbledore kind of snapping his fingers or, or doing or doing whatever that results in all the food uh, appearing in the hall, the mess hall where all the students eat. Now, you might look at that and think, oh, he's just magically making that food happen. But apparently in the books, my brother was telling me how all these elves below the mess hall prepare the food and all Dumbledore is, is doing is, is transporting the food. He's not making it. So I'm sure there's lots of stuff to learn from the books but if you haven't read the books, and I mean, I've already read, uh, I've only read half of them. There's still lots that I could learn as well. So yeah, I, I can understand uh, the the comparison in the way that yeah, sometimes I might talk about super- superheroes and comic books, but that's only from my limited knowledge of the movies, not from the comic books. And you would know more than I would. So I, I, I hear I hear what you're saying. So we have to rejoice. First of all, it, yes. it, it's, it's Doctor What's birthday today. So. Yep. To Dr. What you knew that? Did you know it was Dr. What's birthday? <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> no, but but no, I was saying yes to the other thing you're gonna say. But yes, I'm still happy that it's Dr. What's yeah, birthday. Yeah, so Dr. <laughs> what, if you're listening, happy belated birthday. Happy belated birthday. There's man. no possible way that you could listen to this the day of your birthday because this won't go out on your birthday. So That's right. we're late, but happy belated birthday. Yep, hope you had a great one, man. <laughs> yes, but let's rejoice. It's like a Dr. What got an early birthday present That's because right. Thursday night mm-hmm. behind closed doors. Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios made a deal yep. for Spider-Man to continue being part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yay. He is going to get one more solo film, mm-hmm. which is going to come out in July 2021. Yep. So just a few years from now. And apparently the other part of this deal is that he will appear in one more MCU movie. Mm. Uh, and which one it is is unclear at this point. Yeah. So first of all, Ben, the movie buff, you texted me as soon as the news came out. Yes, I did. I was so excited for you to know. 
So what do you? What, how do you feel? Are you as excited as I am? Yeah, no, I am. I think, uh, like I said in in our episode, uh, whatever episode we were doing four or five weeks ago, when we first heard the news that they were breaking up, for lack of a better term, um, yeah, it just felt like really inconvenient timing, right? When you finish a, a good movie like Far From Home with that ending and that certain person kind of coming back you just you got to see what's going to happen next and the fact that they were just going to break it off after that seemed like the worst timing uh but i am very happy that they got back together i'm not entirely surprised but i still am a little bit i was kind of 50 50 i was like i wouldn't be surprised if things kind of go their own way and they don't come back together but if they do get back together it's just more more of that news you know and of course everyone's going to want to get a part of that to, to share it with everyone so i'm i'm happy i'm not completely surprised but it's just good that you know mom and dad uh, you know set aside their differences and decide to get back together so we could get a bit more spider-man in the mcu which so far i've been really enjoying and i look forward to the to the next two movies at the very least so apparently disney is now going to finance and get profits for 25 percent of the next spider-man movie Interesting. They, they okay. came in asking for fifty originally, and that's what led Sony to basically like breaking off the deals. Oh, okay. And you know they were getting five percent from Far From Home and Homecoming, so right. Disney certainly uh, got more than nothing, but yeah. they got less than. And Sony gave up some ground as well, so there was a oh, bit okay. of compromise there. That's good. There are three different ways people are online are interpreting this arrangement. Okay. The first one, which is the one that I'm most anxious about yeah is that that they're saying okay like this new deal it's only for two movies so that right. basically means that now when the next two movies happen then they'll have to renegotiate again right which if that becomes the future of spider-man and the mcu that's kind of scary for me just because it's like we have to keep coming back to these contract negotiations mom and dad are going to have a lot of fights <laughs> possibly we'll see <laughs> and so that there's that i guess that threat that like oh like this could be it like the yeah. deal the next time they negotiate could be be the the end and we just have to accept that right the second interpretation of the news is say this is indeed allowing them to now make these next two films spider-man's swan song his end game for the mcu right okay so they'll you know doing one more spider-man movie will complete the tom holland trilogy mm -hmm. and having him appear one more time in another marvel movie will basically be a chance for him to say goodbye to all of the other marvel characters right yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is of the three options, this is the one I'm most like afraid is the truth. Yeah, I could see this being the the outcome. Because if and I have to remind myself, okay, if I had to choose between him not being part of the MCU at all going forward, yeah. or this option where this is it, like these two movies are the last two times. Yeah. At least this allows his arc in the MCU to have closure. Yes, absolutely. Which again, I can't complain too much because at least it's it's gonna be a better future than the one we had a week ago 100 percent agree the third way people are interpreting this news and the way in which i'm hoping is the case yeah has a lot to do with apple actually okay so i don't know if you've heard about this but apple is launching their streaming service yes in I've november seen a few. yeah that's right and there is rumors in hollywood that apple is looking to buy sony pictures oh. because unlike everyone else who is developing a streaming service Apple doesn't have a library of films and television to put on their streaming service. That's right, yeah. They're like Netflix was in the beginning where they are relying on licensing agreements with other producers to put content on their service. Mm. So the thought is that if Apple chooses to buy Sony Pictures, they will get access to all the movies and TV shows that have been pr produced by Sony Pictures. Right. Now, this is a win for Apple, but it's also essentially a win for Sony, the parent company, because let's remember... Sony is a massive company that is into technology and gaming and, yep. you know, Sony TVs and, and smartphones and everything exactly, else. Exactly, yeah. They're everywhere. So for them, Sony Pictures is kind of just like a, I don't know, like a, one of their like children, I suppose, if you want to think. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think of Sony as the parent company, exactly. Sony Pictures is like one of their kids. Right. So it would be a way for Sony, the parent company, to actually just make a bunch of money and selling off their movie TV productions company mm, so they could yeah. focus more on the technology. It's right. kind of the same logic Fox had for selling off their film division. Right. We're going to focus on the stuff we like sports and news and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and having a, having a television network. Now, why is this interesting for Spider-Man? Because the original deal that was signed between Sony and Marvel stipulates that if Sony pictures were to ever get sold, and purchased by a different company, mm -hmm. all of the rights for Spider-Man would go back to Marvel. 
Oh. So. Ooh, that's juicy. Yeah. So <laughs> that so that rumor, I I look at this new deal through the lens of that rumor because okay. this is this is how the third way people are interpreting the announcement mm-hmm. is they're saying okay, it's only a two picture deal, and these two movies will most likely come out in the next couple of years. Yeah. What this allows Sony to do is basically make as much Spider-Man money as they can yeah. before they're sold off and they lose access to Spider-Man altogether. So that, of course, is the it's like the longest shot, of course, uh, yeah, because everything yeah. that I just mentioned is a rumor. It's nothing. None of this is confirmed. That's right. But there is kind of like a logic to each of those yeah. thought processes and those conclusions. So that is the case I'm hoping is the case where yeah. and it's actually they only did a two picture deal because Sony knows that they're only going to have Spider-Man so much longer. Mm-hmm. And Marvel knows as well. It's like, OK, well, if we just play this out, they're going to be sold and we're going to get Spider-Man anyway. Right. Oh man, that's a lot to unpack. Jeez, where to begin? So, if it, if it's the second option, if it's Spider Man's only in the next two, it, it, he has a solo movie and then another like uh, team up movie. Um, I I would be okay with that for the reason that while the five movies we've had from him w- so far, uh, from Civil War, his first appearance in the MCU up until uh, Far Far From Home, that's all been great. And and yeah, having those two extra movies, like you said, gives closure. For him, which is good in the same way that, you know, without getting into any spoilers in the last few years, we've kind of seen closure from other characters in, in the MCU. Um, and, and what's really cool to think about for me is that I think about some of the other superhero movies, comic book movies that we've had in the last 10, 15 years. And sometimes, like, let's say, for example, you know, Tobey Maguire only played Spider-Man three times. And it was, and it was from 2002 to 2007. That was it. Andrew Garfield only played Spider-Man two times from two t- 2012 to 2014. Uh, the fact that Toby, that um, Tom Holland gets to play Spider-Man possibly at most seven times from 2016 until whenever that team-up movie is, that's still pretty cool. And the fact that we get to see him in seven different movies, not two, not three, but seven, like that that's still a pretty good run. And even like what we had... If Sony and Disney did not make up, that five movie run was still pretty good. Just the the thing that was uh, that hurt the most in a way was the fact that we left Far From Home on on a major cliffhanger. If we didn't leave it on a cliffhanger and then that that news broke, it would be sad. But at least we felt like, okay, well, we still had a pretty good run. But here it's like we had a good run and then there's a cliffhanger, but we're not going to deal with that anymore. Like, how is that going to work? So it's nice that it seems like they will be able to find a way to make that work. If that's the second option. if and, and the third option makes sense to me because, let's face it, I, I'm not a CEO of any <laughs> gigantic conglomerate <laughs> or, or company, but in my line of work, and I would imagine if you were a CEO, if you were a big boss and you had big decisions to make with your big companies, you got to be looking ahead, right? Especially in this day and age where you have streaming services and where you have all these big movies and franchises and this uh, this franchise is being uh, bought by this company and this company is being bought by an even bigger company. Um, it would make sense that looking ahead, they're trying to figure out, let's try and make more money off of Spider-Man before we lose him. Because that is an interesting point in the contract that if they lose, if they get bought by another company, that they uh, that they have to give Spider-Man back to Marvel because if that's the case, then that means we would have Spider-Man for a very long time, w- which is pretty cool. But of course, we also got to take into consideration, you know, is Tom Holland going to be playing Spider-Man when he's forty? Probably not. But it means what well, we might get more of a future with him. I don't know. Uh, he now. said on, he said in an interview he wanted to play Spider-Man until he couldn't walk anymore. So really, oh, okay. And and you know what? To be honest, I, I I don't know exactly how they do it, but I am interested about the idea that. A lot of the times we see Peter Parker as a teenager. We've seen him in some movies as like a college student. It would be kind of cool to maybe see like how does the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man continue? Have you not seen Spider-Verse? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, no, true, no, fair enough, fair enough. But but I'm saying like because as as awesome as Spider-Verse was, like it was a big balancing act, right? It was like you 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 get a bit of that, but only only a part of it because really it's Miles Morales' story, and right. he gets to see all these other characters. Whereas if we had Tom Holland like at forty years old, maybe he has a family and he's still trying to be Spider Man. That could be kind of cool having a two hour movie specifically about that. So I'd be very interested if it was that third option, and we got to see Tom Holland playing Spider Man, like you say, uh, until he can't walk. There's actually a comic book being published by Marvel right now, written by J.J. Abrams and his son. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> about a very similar situation where okay. Spider-Man has a son and Mary right. Jane has died in some kind of oh. a villain-related thing. And yeah. So it's it's a father-son dynamic where Peter Parker's older and yeah. 
he's missing an arm. It's like it's it's uh, oh wow. It's maybe that'll be the movie we see. Who knows? Uh, who knows? Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of uh, vaguely reminded of something like Logan, right, where we got to see Wolverine, you know, in his in, in the days of his prime during the X Men movies, and then in X Men Origins, uh, Wolverine and all that, and the Wolverine, and seeing Logan was kind of like. You know, Wolverine had more or less, Logan more or less, had kind of retired and like he wasn't into the superhero business anymore until like this one last job kind of comes up, which, yes, is a cliche, but it's still such a dramatic thing. And we've had lots of um, movie stars and other characters kind of go through that where they've, they've had like an incredible life and then they're old. They don't think they're going to do anything more spectacular, but hey, there's one last job. There's something you have to do before you either retire or before you, uh, you pass away. And, and to see, a character like Spider-Man, someone who we, we associate with being this young kid who like is still kind of learning the ropes and figuring out who he is and and, and lessons from, from Uncle Ben and all that. It would be really cool, yeah, to see like an older Spider-Man. So who knows? Maybe we'll get that. Now, assuming the second option is true and he gets one more appearance in a non-Spider-Man movie... Mm-hmm. Do you would which of the like the Phase Four movies that have been announced would you want it to be, or perhaps it's a movie that hasn't been announced yet? Yeah, because like I'm trying to remember out of the movies that have been announced, we have like a Black Widow movie, so I don't think that, that one's would just work. finished filming. So yeah, yeah exactly. so yeah, so that that one's out of the running. We got the Eternals, which okay. I don't think would be a good fit. Yeah, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I I mean, you probably know better than than I do, but I, I yeah, I'm trying to think of all the the movies that are coming out, and like I don't know what would he fit into any of them. Like, what do you think? Do you uh, think is there one? That hasn't been. I, I think the Doctor Strange ones might be he, like there are a lot of Doctor Strange Spider-Man team ups, but I feel like there's already enough going on in that one with him and Black and uh, Scarlet Witch being in the same yeah, movie. Yeah, exactly. So then, then we look at Thor: Love and Thunder again. There's already enough characters in that one, so like, and they're, they're elsewhere, right? Like they would probably yeah. be. I mean, Spider-Man's been to space before at this point. No, that's true. Um, and then we got Blade, which. He's he was Blade was in the '90s Spider-Man cartoon, so maybe they could throw uh, yeah. Spider-Man in there. Uh, and then there's also Black Panther two, mm-hmm. which has been announced yep. in 2022. So that would mean it would be coming out after this Spider-Man movie, right? Again, maybe it could work. Like Spider-Man's a character that literally has teamed up with like everyone in Marvel Comics at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like they could probably fit him in anyone. But the one that I think makes the most sense is whenever they make this new Fantastic Four movie, oh. because as you can see from this copy yes, I have, of that's right. The first issue of Amazing Spider-Man, mm-hmm. uh, Peter Parker has a long history with the Fantastic Four. Right. Him and uh, the Human Torch, Johnny Storm, are famously really good friends in the comics. Right. Okay. And he like looks up to Reed Richards as like a science mentor and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh man. And people are like speculating online, like how are they going to fold the Fantastic Four into the MCU, considering we've yeah. never heard about them. And there's like two theories. One is like, well, we'll say they've been in space this whole time, and so they come back to Earth after being away for a long time. Right. Or the second option is like, well, they've been exploring the multiverse. They've been exploring mo- alternate dimensions, and so oh. they kind of pop back in. The only way I can think that they would want to end Spider-Man's story is to basically have him leave the MCU. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about, frankly, this idea of, oh, let's just have him go off in a different through a portal into the Spidey verse, the spider verse. (laughs) Right. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Because the spider verse, uh, the Sony pictures that are currently existing, if we assume they're not going to get bought and they're going to continue making Spider-Man movies on their own without Marvel. You know, they've already made Venom. They've made the spider verse movie, which confirms that there is at least a Spider-Man multiverse. Mm -hmm. They could easily have Tom Holland walk through a portal and it's like he's no longer in the MCU universe, and now he's in like the universe Venom is in. Oh, okay. so they could continue making movies with Tom Holland. It's just that he's no longer in the universe of the MCU. That would be, that's a little mind blowing. Like just hearing about, just thinking about that possibility, that would be kind of cool. Like, and that that's kind of I guess your way to have your cake and eat it too is that Tom Holland still gets to wrap up being in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then yeah, like you say. If he were to go into another universe and gets to still have movies, but maybe as his own separate thing. Yeah, that's really cool. And and you know what? To think about the fact that I haven't seen the the Josh Trank uh, Fantastic Four movie that came out a few years ago, but I have seen the, 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 the first two that Tim Story did in the mid-2000s. I wasn't a huge fan of either. I hear the Josh Trank one, unfortunately, is not that good. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but I, I would really hope that maybe because 20th Century Fox owns... Fantastic Four, right? And now Disney owns Fox, meaning that, yeah, if, if they could get, if they could make the Fantastic Four work, and then also have Spider Man kind of work with them, and then maybe, yeah, there's some kind of big adventure 
intergalactic adventure they go on and then it results in Peter Parker deciding that maybe he wants to go into another dimension. Yeah, that would be really cool. I'm uh, Who knows what will happen in the next five or ten years, but I, I would be totally open to that. I'm, And this is the only reason why I'm thinking that is because there's a quote from Kevin Feige about this new Spider-Man deal. Where yeah. he, he basically says, oh, Spider-Man is a cultural icon and he's the only superhero with the superpower to go between universes. Like, right. He's like, he's like, cause as <laughs> yeah. we continue with him in the Marvel cinematic universe, he'll also be a part of Sony's Spidey verse. Right. So that leads me to believe if the second option is true yeah. and we're saying goodbye to the MCU version of Spider-Man, mm-hmm. um, it makes sense to me that they would try and find a movie where they could like, basically write his character out of the story so like explain why he no longer pops up in future movies right yeah man that's geez you know it's funny we've seen so many comic book movies and superhero movies in the last a while i guess technically we're like 19 years now if we're we're considering x-men to be kind of like the beginning of the of, of the superhero comic book renaissance but it's still crazy and kind of cool to think about there's still so many possibilities. Oh yeah. Uh, of of I mean, and, and I mean, we have uh, we have to thank the treasure trove of all the comics that have been written that are currently being written. But it's so cool to wonder, like, what what is the future going to hold, especially after something like Endgame? To wonder what happens now that that gigantic conflict is finished. So you've given me lots to think about, uh, Average Joe. So that's uh, super cool. So I really hope the third option is the real option, where again, yeah. <laughs> Apple, please write a check. Just do it, please. Right. You got the money, right? Yeah, surely. <laughs> you need content for that streaming service, especially since That's you got. Right. I didn't. They, they just they just announced that a uh, NBC and Universal streaming service is going to be called Peacock. Really? After the NBC logo. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're going to have HBO Max, the Time Warner streaming service. You can have Peacock. You can have Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Netflix, Apple TV Plus. You guys got to get content. To compete, so just buy Sony that's pictures. Right. Do it, do it now, <laughs> please. Um, wow, that's crazy. And Sony, Disney, if you guys are listening to this episode, thank you for listening to me. Yes, <laughs> and the instructions we gave to make a deal. I appreciate it. And you know, to celebrate this deal, Sony, I gave you some of my money today. I went out and actually bought Into the Spider Verse on Blu-ray. <laughs> so that's my way of saying thank you. And I also bought the movie too a few weeks ago. Uh, so yes, that was also my way of saying thank you for for an awesome movie. And when I do my uh, best of movies list by the end of this year, Spider Man of the Spider Verse is a really good chance it's going to be in the top ten. So just because it's it's really but, enjoyable. But that's a 2018 release. Eight. No, I know it's because I saw it this year in 2019. Oh so, right, so, that's, so that's how that's, that's, that's how yeah, I do it. That's right. That's how you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So even if I saw a movie, if I saw a movie from the 70s for the first time this year. If I like it and put it in my top ten, yeah, it's because I saw it in twenty one nineteen. That's the the commonality right. that all these and movies have. And I like have. that about those videos, actually. That's yeah, just yeah, yeah, the way I do it. I don't have enough time to see uh, sixty new movies in, in theaters in a, in a given year. Wow. And also, Sony, I'm sorry uh, for telling everyone to not go see the extended version of Far From Home in theaters. <laughs> um, you know, if I could go back in time and take back those mean words, I would. Average but, Joe is just hurting. You got to understand, we're we're all hurting at that news, but now you've made it better. So, uh, water under the bridge, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I and I hope that the third option is true. Yes. Um, the first option is the most stressful because it just means that we're gonna have to live in like contract extension shenanigans forever. Yeah. The second option would be is at this point the most realistic, but I it's again it's better than nothing. Yeah. Third option is the most ideal, but it's also at this point I feel like the longest shot. Yeah. So. Time will tell. Anyway, that was a big, long yeah. departure <laughs> from what we're supposed to be talking about today. Yep. Um, we're talking about Bionicle. Mm-hmm. And that that's uh, a callback to the thing you mentioned at the beginning yes. with the language stuff. So we had a listener, Paul Rulo, send us a message telling us to watch Bionicle, The Legend Reborn. Um, however, when I transcribed it to paper for The Bachelor, I just wrote Bionicle movies. Oh. So uh, apologies, Paul, we did not actually watch The Legend Reborn. I watched Mask of Light, which was the first Bionicle movie. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about the Bionicle franchise a bit here, and then we'll talk about Mask of Light. And then I did watch like a 12-minute YouTube video about the new The Legend Reborn. So okay. we'll talk about that briefly at the end here. Yeah. So Ben the Movie Buff, do you have any, before this week, did you have any prior knowledge of Bionicle? From great victories, mighty heroes arise. The Toa had repelled the Borok swarms and were forever transformed. The Toa received masks of greater power, improved body armor, and new enhanced tools giving them surprising dual action abilities. 
Otto Anuva. Bionicle. Each set sold separately. Yes, uh, Bionicle brings me back to one Easter morning when I was probably 11 or 12 years old. And my little brothers and I, like we all have our Easter baskets out, which of course we go to bed and then the Easter bunny <laughs> comes right in and uh, puts down candy and eggs and this and that in our baskets. And sometimes we get either little toys or little knickknacks. And one year, I don't know if all of us got Bionicles, but about three or four of us got Bionicles because I think my older brother was probably too old for, for Bionicles, so he got something else. But three or four of us got Bionicles. And we'd all loved Lego uh, since, uh, you know, as, as far back as we can rem remember. And yeah, I remember getting these Bionicles and, of course, not knowing what to make out of it because it wasn't the exact same kind of pieces you'd find in a Lego set. But it still kind of had that like you know, like Lego 2.0 kind of feeling, right? That it's like, oh, we've souped it up and changed it a bit, but it's something different from a familiar uh, brand. And I remember once we put them together, we would play with them nonstop. And I'm sure there are a whole bunch of family photos of us playing with our Bionicles. I can't remember which one I got, but I know we all liked the lava one, the one that could uh, surf on lava. So... Um, yeah, and I don't recall being interested in Bionicle for that long, but I do remember having one or two of the toys, liking it for a bit. But I think my younger brothers enjoyed it for a few more years, uh, more more than I did. So when the Lego movie came out five years ago now, yeah. I didn't have as much of an emotional connection to the movie because yeah. I did not grow up with your conventional Lego bricks and mini figurines. Right, okay. Uh, I didn't, I just didn't, that's just not what I had. Bionicle was indeed my first real experience of Lego. Oh, that's cool. Okay. As, a, as a company. Yeah. And they they use the Lego Technic system, so all the parts and pieces that are used for Bionicles are they're still construction, you know, toys yeah. made of plastic that connect together to build something. Yeah. But they're they're much more I don't know, intricate and the pieces are kind of like more specifically used for specific purposes. That's right. Yeah. They're not as uh inter changeable yeah and there's like some they had like gear mechanics and pins and basically pieces that can make things more stable yes and they had like ball joints so it like was more like you could build figures that were essentially more like action figures right so i was super into bionicle for a few years mm -hmm. i remember i had pohatu i think was his name the the brown one that oh cool so yeah, like yeah most yeah. of them had swinging arms yes and was he cool. was upside down so he had swinging legs so he came with this <laughs> he came with his little like brown boulder that you could kick like a soccer ball oh that's right yeah i remember that oh man but they were they were cool because you could basically build these build your own action figure and then they had masks that went on their faces yes and their little cases were like these pods where you can like pretend they were like spaceships or that's like right yeah storage containers yep, for them exactly so i was in a bionicle pretty hard for a few years and i remember like wanting to get the whole set because there were six characters yep. they each had a different color and represents a different element mm -hmm. and so you know it's very strategic and then they had of course corresponding villain characters yes for each of the the main six characters and then they had vehicles and all this stuff so it was it was a grand old time mm -hmm. however as a child growing up enjoying these products i had no idea what was going on behind the scenes with Lego. Okay. There's a great Netflix original series called the toys that made us. Yes. And there is an episode of that show about Lego mm -hmm. and they talk about the late 1990s as a very terrible time for Lego. Yep. That's right. Um, and I didn't realize how bad it was for them until I watched that documentary. But in that show, they explain that in 1998 Lego actually made losses yeah. They actually like spent more money than they had as profits. Yes. And then in 1999, they laid off a thousand people Wow. because the profits are so bad. Oh, and it was, it was the first time they'd ever done that. Mm -hmm. And then the following year in, in January of 2000, they also posted a set of losses that led to another 500 job losses. Oh my goodness. And this is when Lego started to kind of move beyond their conventional system of just basically releasing sets based on generic, uh, you know, because part of the Lego philosophy was like building toys that encouraged free play and allowed kids right. to kind of do whatever they wanted with it, not to like prescribe you to build a specific thing or, exactly. you know, it's like create your own story. Not, not because we're lazy and can't think of a story to tell, <laughs> yeah. but because we want to encourage you and use your imagination to create your own stories. Yes. However, the late 90s was a time period when there were a lot of popular things coming out like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and Beyblade yeah. oh, man. that 
were very different and like they they came with prescribed rules and stories that you just sort of got captured by and fell along with yeah and so the first thing lego did to try and respond to the changes in the market Mm -hmm. was they started uh, making kits and sets based on licensed properties yeah so in 1998 as they were making losses for the first time they did lego star wars yes so in 1999 i should say the first set of licensed lego products were released with lego star wars Mm -hmm. and it was a hit they they sold a lot of sets because you could buy you could buy versions of vehicles and characters and and scenes from the star wars movies Mm -hmm. which at that point were really only the original trilogy yeah um and they they were a huge hit because it was like oh my gosh it's like it's lego but it's also star wars yeah it's such an obvious thing of like oh take this thing that we're all familiar with and then put the Lego spin on it. Not only can you be creative and build all this cool stuff, but you also get to see Lego versions of all these different characters that we've known for so many years. And on top of that, I would venture to guess that Lego Star Wars was so popular. That's why we have all the Lego themed video games like Lego Star Wars, Lego Lord of the Rings, Lego yeah. Harry Potter, I think is one of them yep. too. So so yeah, clearly it was a good business move. But the problem was they couldn't control the content. Okay. They had to pay Lucasfilm money to use their properties. Right. And they were kind of reliant on Lucasfilm to create new movies and new products. Right. So in 1999, when The Phantom Menace came out, they had a whole bunch of new stuff they could make. Yeah. But then in the year 2000, there was no Star Wars movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So they, they their sales went down again because they didn't have any more Star Wars stuff to use. Yeah. And this is this is where this was apparently like a really a big turning point in the Lego company's history because Mm -hmm. they were losing money. They were laying people off and they had to really decide how are we going to survive in the new toy market? Right. And so this idea was, well, let's respond to what's popular. Let's try and do more of what is actually doing well in the toy industry. So I want to quote, I'm looking at this article here and I want to quote what this one woman said. Mm -hmm. So this is a quote from Ann Flemert. She is a, or was at the time, a senior researcher at the Lego Learning Institute. Okay. And this is what she had to say. Just like our society, children's play is much more complex than it has ever been. And toys are increasingly knowledge and rule based, like Pokemon, Beyblade, and Yu-Gi-Oh. And then she mentions about Bionicle. Bionicle is one of the first examples of this company starting to loosen up a bit. When we started Bionicle, designers and engineers and marketing people sat down as a team and worked on the concept and developed it sequentially together. Do you agree with this comment that Anne has made about the the changing time? I mean, I realize this is like 20 years ago now. Yeah, no, no, I I agree. I I think it goes to show that, and as as usual, I always kind of bring this back to the movies, but the movies uh, are kind of a similar, there, there, uh, there can be a comparison made because the way people would watch and experience movies and the kind of content you'd see in movies of like, let's say the fifties, for example, was different than what you'd see in the sixties. And then it also changed again in the seventies. It's like every decade, something kind of changes and the way like we're experiencing and enjoying movies now and the way like you can see all these different, incredible and sometimes like crazy violent or vulgar things in movies nowadays, you would never see 50 years ago, right? Because we weren't there yet. So anyways, but yeah, to bring it back to to Lego, yeah, I think it goes to show that as society progresses forward, something that was popular 10 years ago might not be popular now. And and, I mean, to be fair, there are some things, and and, I mean, I'm I'm going off on a limb just saying this, but um, Nerf guns, for example, I feel like when Nerf guns became a popular thing, I feel like there's a way to still kind of have the same basic fun with a Nerf gun and like, you know, doing different kind of designs and like, oh, this shoots, uh, you know, uh, 10 Nerf darts uh, in five seconds. Right. And this one is just a, a, a one a one shot sort of deal that there are some things that I feel like are so ubiquitous that you can't help but have fun with it. So you could keep that going and basically do the same thing for a long time. And you'd think you'd be able to do something like that with Lego. And, and I suppose more or less, I've still seen lots of Lego sets and different kind of uh, sets over the last 10 or 15 years. But I think it goes to show that, yeah, sometimes you need, need to also show people that you can do something uh, different. So it makes sense that with, uh, and also as a business move too, that Bionicle was kind of a step in a different direction, but there was still some building involved, even if you didn't have to be as creative because you were just 
uh, what's the word? You were just uh, following an, an instruction manual. But for me, anytime like I played with toys, sometimes I'd, I'd work with a story that I already knew of. For example, like Star Wars was an easy one. Like I'd always recreate my favorite scenes. But then sometimes I think to myself, what if these characters went on a different adventure? Something we never saw in the movies. And then I always thought that would be a fun thing to play through. So I imagine even with Bionicle, Bionicle there would still be this sense of creativity because you could still create your own stories if you wanted to. Which if I was a bit younger and into Bionicle, I would have done. But I, I feel like, yeah, they clearly realized that the numbers were dropping because I guess kids in a way were kind of losing interest about this the same kind of Lego sets they were getting. And yeah, sometimes you just got to do something different, pull something different out of your hat and say, kind of similar, kind of different, but it's still fun. What do you think? And, and roll with that. Like I was not an Andy from Toy Story. I was not a kid who like right. created all these crazy scenarios for all my toys to be a part yeah. of. I kind of just like adapt i guess like more or less just follow the stories that the toys that i had were based on yeah so it's interesting for me to hear about that basically i was growing up in a time when these story and rule-based games are being introduced because that you know the fact that beyblade and Yu-Gi-Oh and pokemon were all tv shows mm -hmm. it became very easy for me to be like i want to live out what is happening on the screen so i'm gonna get the things like yeah e even my power ranger toys like i remember i had one megazord where yep. in the show, the guy controlled it by, like, talking into his uh, morpher. Right, yeah, yeah, And yeah. The, the toy worked the same way. So, like, I spoke vocal commands uh. <laughs> into the thing on my wrist. That's so cool. And the robot, the toy robot, responded the same way. Yeah. So, like, my imagination was, by, was activated by, like, recreating the things I had seen on yeah. TV. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it seems like the traditional kind of Lego, in, you know, system of play was more so encouraging kids to just create the scenarios on their own. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't realize how controversial Bionicle was mm -hmm. for the time. It really right. seems to have become a pivoting point for the Lego company. Right. Because as people have pointed out, the storyline behind Lego or behind Bionicle, <laughs> excuse me, was the biggest selling point. That's the right. The fact that there was a story and a universe surrounding. It wasn't just here are some toys that look cool. Yeah. Like they actually released the story on their website mm -hmm. before – the toys were out and they, they had DC comics published comic books uh, telling yep. the story of Bionicle. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I don't remember reading those, mm -hmm. um, but of course there's info in the back of the boxes and stuff. So yeah, I, I didn't follow the story of Bionicle religiously, right. but I knew an, it, the fact that there was a story was like, Oh, like there, there's rules for me to kind of play in basically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that kind of goes back to what that, what this lady said about rules based story uh, in get in play. Apparently, yeah, like the the concept of Bionicle was very controversial at Lego because mm -hmm. in addition to their products meaning to emphasize free play and encouraging the imagination, they also didn't want any of their toys to demonstrate modern warfare or violence. Right. So you could argue that Bionicle, it's not modern warfare per se, but there are weapons, there are swords and axes. Oh, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. You know, all kinds of melee weapons and yep. things that shoot projectiles. So yep. <laughs> I think that's probably something as they've adapted more and more movie uh, movie licenses, they've kind of moved away from that as, yes. um, or at least downplaying that. But Exactly, yeah. But I, I got to say kudos to the people at Lego who kind of saw what was happening in the toy industry and moved forward with this idea of Bionicle as like, here's something that is going to go completely against what a lot of us here probably think is what we should do. Because when you already have an identity and you know, identify with these values, I'm sure it's very hard to put those values in the question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that, yeah, I, I would imagine a lot of people, my, myself included, were... Um, we're uh, creatures of, of comfort, right? Like we have, we have our habits, we have our things we like to stick by. And, you know, sometimes you might hear like a different idea that takes you in, in another path. And you might think to yourself, you're like, well, no, I don't know if I want to do that because I'm more comfortable with the way things have worked. Right. But clearly there, there was an issue with uh, sales and all that. So it makes sense that, yeah, they, you know, sometimes you just got to try something different because how many times do certain ideas uh, for movies or certain people that uh, pitch songs to uh, recording uh, producers and whatnot. How many times do people see a certain kind of art and say to themselves, no, nah, I don't know if that's going to work. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to be interested in that. And then boom, once someone takes a risk on, uh, risk on that person, everyone wants a piece of it. And Bionicle was no ex uh, exception. So it was released in Europe in December of 2000. Mm -hmm. And then when it did well there, they launched it in north america in 2001 which yep. lines up with when i would have found the toys yeah and apparently 
the success of Bionicle was so great that it basically like recovered all of the loss that yeah. Lego had felt in the previous decade. I believe it. So well done, Bionicle. You yep. saved Lego. Good and job. Way to go. If it weren't for Bionicle, there'd be no Lego movie. There'd be none That's of the, right. as you point out, the Lego video games or any of the yep. Lego Harry Potter, Lego Batman, Lego Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. that short-lived Lego Dimensions video game. Oh, that that's right. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> kind of faded away into obscurity. I could picture it, but yeah, I'm like, I couldn't remember the name, but I was thinking of that when I was listing the, the Lego video game titles. So yeah, I had the Bionicle toys. I loved playing with them. And no surprising, like I said, there were comic books, there were video games, there were all kinds of, it was a true franchise. And it was the first time that Lego as a company invested in their own intellectual property. Right. And this is a, this really... This being Bionicle set the standard for Lego going forward. So while they mm -hmm. continue to this day to do licenses of other people's intellectual properties, yeah, they have also developed their own brands, yeah, like Lego Friends, Lego Ninjago, Ninjago yeah, uh, The Legend of Chima, yeah. You know they have Lego. I think there's one called Hero Factory. Like they have, right. they've developed their own intellectual properties. Mm -hmm. So they they've kind of got into the story game and and they've. And you know what? Even with the Bionicles I had, I was able to kind of like put, you know, mishmash the parts and kind of like make my own Bionicles anyway. Yeah. Someone made a point about that on the facts video that you linked to me uh, last night was that even though there might have been less creativity involved, you could still get a whole bunch of Bionicle pieces uh, together. Like, you know, you could have like this, the six Bionicle heroes and take them apart and, and you could still do certain things with it. In a way, you could almost argue like, oh, it's more of a challenge because... There's not as many ideas you can do, but there's still some. So try and figure out if, if anything can work. And I think that's also a good way to stimulate someone's uh, mind when when they have that to be able to figure out what can I do. And, and, and even if you spent a lot of time and you still come up with something, it means you, you manage to find something that doesn't look like, I don't know, an abstract piece of art that belongs in a museum, but something that looks like, oh, here's another cool t kind of toy that I was able to make from these pieces. So, yeah, I think it's still possible. Now... And this eventually led to Bionicle making direct-to-video movies. Yeah. Be and this is, again, a first for Lego. Like, actually, like, you know, going all the way and actually, like, doing what other toy companies were doing and yeah. making making films and animations to promote their toy lines. And one of the critiques Paul Rulo had of Bionicle, he said, like, oh, it felt like a 70-minute commercial. Right. Which, to be fair, is basically what these Bionicle movies turned out being because that's yeah. that they're there to promote the toy lines that's right that's what transformers is there for gi joe my exactly. little pony like all these things yeah, yeah yeah you know so to your co your cons your comment yeah it definitely is but nonetheless we will talk about uh, mask of light which mm -hmm. was the first of these bionicle uh, direct-to-video movies yeah i do remember watching this when it came out and being excited about it because mm -hmm. it featured all of the characters that i had played with yeah and I was like, this is so cool. I get to hear them talk mm -hmm. and I get to like see them move in animation. And In a time before time, in a world you've only imagined, a shadow will be cast. A hero will be chosen. And a great adventure will come to light. Bionicle, Mask of Light, the movie. It was introducing this like seventh Toa who was like the Toa of Light. That's right. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I remember getting his toy and his like vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, I remember being excited about it and actually like watching it and I was I remember enjoying it as a kid. I didn't think it was the greatest movie ever. Yeah. And rewatching it this week, you can actually find the whole thing on YouTube. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. For free. Someone uploaded it and no one's struck down the copyright on it, which that's pretty cool. Probably means it's like so uh, unimportant that <laughs> that no one cares to claim the copyright on it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it turns out all in all, there were four Bionicle movies. Mm -hmm. There were three that were made kind of like each year yeah. back to back. And then... And then in 2009, they made The Legend Reborn, yeah, which was the one that Paul Rulo had asked us to look at. Right. Um, so I only really had time to watch The Mask of Light. Did you get a chance to watch any of these movies? So here's the way I did it. And for all you hardcore Bionicle fans that are listening, I'm sorry. I'll make some time to watch them in full. But 
I think I've seen the Mask of Light before because I think my my little brothers had it. So I've probably seen it before in full. Uh, but what I did for, for the three movies, because like you said, they kind of made one every year, every other year. Um, I... I watched like the first 10 to 15 minutes of each one just to get a taste of it. And then I would kind of go online to get an idea of, uh, of like the plot synopsis of, of what they were like. And um, yeah, so like from what I saw, it seems to be playing to its target audience. And like I could, I, I think I was a little too old by the time when Bi- Bionicle was getting popular. Because I mean, I, at that time I was into filmmaking. I was into Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. There was just other stuff that I was so focused on. But if I were like three or four years younger, I could see myself totally jumping aboard the Bionicle train and, and eating that up, uh, it, you know, with all the movies and, and toys that they were making. Because I remember the, the initial Warriors that they had released, and then I also remember the, and I can't remember the name of them because like a lot of these names are kind of hard to remember, but the ones that basically looked like balls, right? And like and when, like their heads moved it, that, That's right, yeah. This is, so that was cool. And then like you take out the, you know, each side and it looks like they kind of like two two shields. Yeah. Uh, so, so those were really cool. But yeah, as for the movies, I was kind of skimming through them. I called the Bo-Rock. Bo Rock, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, the Bo Rocks. Um, yeah, so I, I watched a bit of the the movies uh, last night, and you know, heck, I could see myself like my little son Dexter, who's only, geez, about two <laughs> two and a half months old. See, it, it's 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 funny with with a little boy, right? Because like every week, everyone's asking like, how many weeks old is he? And like, it changes every week. So whereas like for us, it's like, how old are you? Oh, I'm thirty. I'm gonna be thirty for another year. <laughs> you know, like when when you have a a young son, like the the number keeps on changing. That's why I, I uh, stalled there for a second. But even he was kind of looking at the screen because he could see all the different colors so I could see like give it like two or three years I could see him getting into this uh, this sort of thing so from what I saw it seemed pleasant yeah so for me the first thing I remembered at the time and was reminded of again when I watched the movie is that it has Vancouver voice actors in it yes so there's voice actors that I recognize from shows I watched as a kid or mm-hmm. anime that I watched for example there's a guy named Scott McNeil who's yeah. in this and he was the Canadian Piccolo and the Canadian dub of Dragon Ball Z. Right. Zed, yeah, yeah. if you're one of those people. Yep. He was Wolverine in one show called X-Men Evolution. Nice. Uh, he's got a very distinctive voice. So if you yep. hear him, you probably you'd recognize him from somewhere. And he plays like the red guy. And I'm like, yeah, he was one of the best characters. So like to have him um, get to do. Oh, and he was a bunch of people in Beast Wars, too. Oh, OK. No, yeah, Beast he, Wars is my jam. He, I, was, he was Rat Trap, Dinobot and Waspinator. Oh, my. So Beast Wars, oh, dude, yeah, I Beast Wars is nostalgic for me. I love Beast Wars. Transformers are cool and all, but Beast Wars was my Transformers uh, a highlight. I, yeah, okay, so that's cool. Yeah, no, I can I can totally think of uh, of Rat Trap's voice and Waspinator and all that. Oh, that that's awesome. Yeah, so it was just fun for me to like. Rec- oh, I recognize that voice. I recognize that yeah. voice and whatever. So one complaint I had at the time and it still holds true for this movie is that you have the six Toa, these characters who are the original toys. They're, they each have a different elemental power. Mm-hmm. They're barely in the movie. Like the main characters right. of the Mask of Light movie are these two little guys yeah. who are kind of like kind of like Lord of the Rings. They're taking they're on <laughs> yeah. a journey to try and take this shiny golden thing. Yeah. In, in this case, they're carrying the Mask of Light around, but you yeah. can easily insert the Mask of Light for like the Ring of Power. Mm-hmm. These two guys are traveling, and it feels very episodic almost because they're literally they're just on their journey, and everywhere they encounter some kind of bad guy, and then one of the Toa shows up to help them. And then yeah. all the Toa don't really do any, they don't really do anything useful until the very end. Yeah. So I was I, I didn't like that as a kid and I was kind of annoyed by it again this week because again they're supposed to be the heroes but they're kind of side characters to the these little guys. So here's my question: the little guys that we follow, um, were they toys yet? Were they Bionicle toys that you could purchase? I think so because I remember hearing in something about basically McDonald's was had a McDonald's or had a Bionicle thing. Right. Yeah. And the ones that they had at McDonald's were these little toys. So they were like these little guys with oh, the shorter okay. figures. So I think they were McDonald's figures. Yeah. See, cause, cause yeah, one thought I had was I, I wouldn't be surprised if they featured the Toa less just to show off other characters that weren't toys yet. So that way, like you advertise them in the movie and then you advertise them as actual toys There's like more toys to get on top of the Toa. But yeah, I'm not sure why would they, they would feature the Toa a little less unless it's one of those things where they want to build up the anticipation. So it's like, oh, this guy, oh, that guy. And then at the very end, all of them come together. Yay. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. But yeah, I couldn't tell yeah. you for sure. I think the new toys that they were selling through the movie were like those uh, kind of like a. Uh, the 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 ba- most of the villains you see are these like reptilian guys that have these like right. spears. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. they were new toys at the time. Yeah. And then of course the the new the seventh Toa 
who shows up at the end of the Toa right. of Light, and his vehicle, those were new toys. So. Right, of course, okay. Uh, and then the villain that shows up at the end, that, and then the fusion of the hero and the villain that shows up at the end, yeah. those were new toys as well. Oh, okay. So it was certainly, yeah, it did, it was probably a bit of that, like emphasizing the new toys over the old toys. Yeah. The animation was passable. Yeah. And they didn't, it wasn't like, the Lego movie in the sense that it, w- it didn't feel like complete recreations of the the kit of the toys. Right. They yeah, like yeah. kind of, they resemble the toys, mm-hmm. but they didn't like, it didn't look like, Oh, like the toys on the screen. Right. Which as we know with the Lego movie, it's actually very easy to do that to like recreate uh, yeah. <laughs> something that looks exactly like the toy. Exactly. And the one thing I didn't really like is like the masks move when they talk. Yeah. It just looks weird. So it's funny. That was a thought I was having last night too, is that, as cool as it is to hear some of these characters talk, you know, the in the facts video I was watching last night, they were showing pictures like I guess kind of like the the pictures that you would see on the original cases when you would buy the various Toa warriors. And when you see them, like they look really cool. They look really intimidating and threatening and it's like, man, you know, no one no one could mess with this Toa cuz this Toa would use his uh, his swords or his axe or whatnot. But there's also kind of an air of mystery to them when you don't know how they talk, right? But then, of course, when you see them in the movie, like even during the uh, kind of uh, the sports entertainment scene uh, towards the beginning, there's a point where I guess the stone uh, uh, Toa kind of comes in and he's like talking to the fire one and and the the water one. And then he's like, let us set aside our differences. And And then like it just feels a little less intimidating when, when some of them started talking. And remember, I didn't watch the whole thing. So maybe some of them sounded better and not to say it was a bad voice, but it's interesting that. You kind of wonder, like, what do they sound like? And then you have this guy who sounds very big and theatrical. It's like, oh, okay, I guess. You know, I, I don't know if it was the the best choice, but I guess that's that's what, the, what they went with. Now, the, the plot of the film is fairly predictable. Yeah. Again, it's like Lord of the Rings, basically. Yeah. With the, <laughs> and the, the Toa basically exists like the Power Rangers. Like, they're a yeah. team of people that are multicolored. Yeah. And they all, like, they, they're better together than they are alone. Like, yeah, you know, of course, so yeah. You know, imagine Lord of the Rings with the power rangers there instead of like the eagles i guess yeah that's right <laughs> um, and then you throw in a little bit of transformers the movie at the end because the the whole time you know you're like who's gonna be the new hero and then it turns out to be that little guy who's impetuous and you've been following the whole time it's like oh you're the one of course yeah who so, knew? so in the way that rodimus or you know in the way hot rod becomes right. rodimus prime right the little guy turns into taka nuva the right the hero of light so mm. It's it's kind of like oh what a twist, but it's uh, yeah. like they were pretty much emphasizing that the whole way through because he's he's apprehensive. He's like oh I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, and his like buddy's like oh fine if you won't do it, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, kind of like the Frodo Sam dynamic almost. I can't carry the ring, but I'll ca- but I can carry you. <laughs> oh, so man. yeah, the the plot itself is fairly simple. Yep. Um, and again, for kids who haven't seen Transformers the movie or Lord of the Rings, it probably doesn't seem that it probably seems more original. Yeah. What I was impressed with when I watched it again this week is that the world building is excellent. Like mm-hmm. they're they they don't over explain things and they like yep. they like it, it. It seems like they put genuine effort into crafting the story for this movie. Yeah, because the world of Bionicle was at that point established and they had like the yeah. names of all and you got the elders there. Like there's a lot of stuff that is seen that they don't go out of their way to explain to you. Yeah, which as we've talked about in this podcast before, it gives you the impression that the characters are. They're in a lived in world. Yes. That there's a world and it's like it, it, it like they've actually they've thought about everything beyond what they're telling you. Because yep. generally with children's programming, they over explain everything and make it as simple as possible. Yeah. Something that, that struck out uh, that, that I felt was really cool also was the even though the visual effects like the actual animation might not have been, you know, like anything remotely close to Pixar, I still liked a lot of the character designs and also the uh, designs of the various areas. I think it's the beginning of the second one where you see kind of different you see a uh, uh, different um, parts of the same city. I think I think it is because you have like this one uh, character who's kind of handing off these items to these other smaller characters who are kind of like, oh, they're just going about their daily business. And then this Toa warrior comes along and kind of gives them these items. And every time like you see a wide shot of like this new area that you're going into, I was being reminded of Star Wars a lot and not in a bad way, but in a, like, oh, that's kind of cool. It has a bit of a Star Wars feel. But not to the point where it feels like it's ripping it off completely. It's just sometimes you see these big big cityscapes where you have like these gigantic buildings and these kind of uh, ships and things kind of flying around. So 
the the design team I, I think definitely has to be applauded and uh, like you say even if the actual story itself is not that riveting there is still some really cool design and and some world building happening here that, that yeah feels like there's almost like well the, this legend right and it's like well we've we've heard about the legend and how does that relate to what we're seeing with these uh, characters on the current adventure they're going on so even though I might have been a little too old for the Bionicle craze when it was happening although like I liked the first few toys that I got from them um I can I can totally see why kids a few years younger than me would totally eat this up because it just it seems really cool and something that you'd want to take part in. Yeah, and again, it's it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It as a as a movie, it it's not worth watching unless you are indeed a hardcore Bionicle fan or you want to introduce your kids to Bionicle. Oh, exactly. Yeah, something fun to show the show the kids. Yeah, because like the 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 climax is ridiculous. It's like it it, it just it seems like every time you think there's going to be a source of conflict, it like, Oh, resolves itself. Or of course, you know, yeah. A character makes a sacrifice. And it's like, Oh my gosh, like he died. And then five seconds later he's revived. That's right. No, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, yeah, not, not that impressive. I think yeah. if, if I had to give it a back cookie rating, I I'd probably say like 2.6 out of four back cookies. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't watch the whole thing, but from the, the general vibe I was getting from the, the uh, clips that I was watching, I'd give it about the same. But like I said, I, I think it's because like it's not it's not exactly, you know, directly like I'm not the target audience. Right. You know, kids that are 20 years younger than me are, are the target audience. But I imagine they're, they're having a great time playing with their toys, watching these movies, because um, like the other thing I was going to say, too. And and I hope I'm o- I'm okay in saying this, and if not, um, you can uh, you can uh, censor this. But I think what helps is that the Bionicles look badass. Like when <laughs> when when you think about it, like you think about a lot of the Lego sets and toys before Bionicle. You know they're cool and this and that and cute and, and and all that. But it seemed to me like when you see the Bionicles, you know, like doing their their thing uh, in the movie, but also just the 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 images, like they look badass they look really threatening surfing like on i was lava. saying earlier yeah exactly. surfing on lava it's like that's cool that that seems like a lot of fun uh and and i feel like that the step in in that direction i think definitely got kids attention when they saw something like that and and once again you know the commonality it has with lego is that like you're still building these building these toys but now you have something really cool you know, compared to maybe the, uh, oh, the uh, interesting little, like, police officers or the Johnny Thunder or the the astronaut-looking uh, lo- guy. Like, now you have the Bionicles, and they were, like, six or seven times bigger than these little Lego toys. So I can see why kids would find that really cool. And it's, like, a, I would say a step in the right direction, clearly, because it, it worked out. <laughs> and this movie did get some acclaim. It actually won uh, the a Saturn Award for the yeah. best DVD release. Yeah. That's so pretty cool. Saturn Awards, if I recall, are awards for like science fiction. Yeah, I believe so. So it got some acclaim, and it it obviously did well enough to get two sequels. So that's right. As yeah. a movie, it seemed to do just fine. Yep. Uh, before we move on, I just want to mention something I thought was interesting. They they talk about the virtues of Mata Nui. Yes. By the way, when I saw Moana and yeah. they say Mata Nui, it's like it's like Mata Nui from Bionicle. Oh yeah, I was totally. My wife was watching the the video with me too, and they're like blah 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 on the island of Mata Nui, and then she's like pause. I pause, and she's like, isn't that the same place in Moana? And I'm like, yeah, it's because they use the the Maori language well, no, as an it's, inspiration. It's Mata Nui, and then yeah. in Moana it's Moto Nui. I think. Are you sure? I think I thought it sounded. Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I'm pretty sure. Like that that opening song I've listened to so many times, the island of Mata Nui. Like I'm pretty sure. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's right. because after all, it comes from the same uh, uh, source. Hence why I, I said Tika <laughs> earlier because of the Maori Maori influence of the Bionicle names. Yes. Which, by the way, before I say anything else, apparently Bionicle is a portmanteau of biological chronicle. Yes. Because the Bionicle characters are meant to be like techno organic. Yep. They don't really the toys themselves don't really look that, but. No, Bionicle, like, it's a cool, created name, that's for sure. Like, it, it clearly has st- stuck around. So, yeah, I like the sound of Bionicle. So, the movie mentions that the this culture has three virtues. Unity, mm-hmm. duty, yeah. and destiny. Yeah. How is destiny... A virtue. I was gonna ask the same thing. I was like, Joe, if you got, if you have anything, please tell me because, yeah, like I, I unity and duty, uh, duty, <laughs> the, the duty. All right, here we go. Unity and duty. I feel like make more sense as virtues than destiny because it seems to me isn't destiny more about like fulfilling your destiny, getting to your goal. Like you use various virtues to get there, 
but destiny has more to do with like a destination hence an actual like you know what destiny is the virtue i, I practice the most it's like what <laughs> yeah it's like you know when they said that it made me think of like our disney princess virtue episode yeah <laughs> exactly it's like, how could you say that because yeah the way i understand a virtue is that it's a it's a morally strong character trait that you can choose or choose not to demonstrate yeah exactly so yeah you can choose to live out of the virtue of duty yeah or service and right. make actions that are in the service of others that it's sacrificial yeah you can choose to live out this virtue of unity by choosing to collaborate and work for the betterment of others. Yeah. But destiny, how do you, do you, do you just <laughs> operate with the, with like, okay, I'm working towards fulfilling my destiny. And, and it's like some kind of humility or like some kind of like, I don't know, docility to a, a greater plan for your life. Yeah. I, I don't know how that could be a virtue. Yeah. So yeah, my destiny is to be a good warrior. I think I'm a good warrior. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> There's my destiny. I've already fulfilled it and I'm living it out. I, I just, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I was curious if you were going to say, oh yeah, destiny may, makes sense for this, but I'm glad you're like, wait, what? Because yeah, I was saying the same thing too. I was like, I don't know how this is a, a virtue. <laughs> but nonetheless, so like I said, Mask of Light got two sequels. You watch clips of them. I haven't seen yep. any of them. Mm -hmm. And then the movie itself that Paul asked about, The Legend Reborn, came yep. out in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched his YouTube video for like 10 minutes about it. Yeah. Apparently, Michael Dorn is the voice of the main character in this. And that's the guy who plays Worf, right? Yeah. Oh, that's so next cool. Next generation. He has, he has a great voice. He has yeah. a great voice. And apparently, the one thing people like about The Legend Reborn is that the character models actually look like the toys. Oh, okay. So it's much more a little recreation of the toys in the environment. Yeah. But everything else about it is fairly forgettable. Okay. And unfortunately, uh, the Lego brand was c shut down in 2010. Mm -hmm. So basically they make this movie in 2009 and then they kill the franchise. So that movie oh. <laughs> had no chance at like continuing on it. Like, yeah. The legend reborn and then immediately canceled, you know, that's right. Re reborn and then re dead. <laughs> So the legend reborn, I'm I'm sure everything you said about it is true, Paul. I'm not gonna try and give it any back cookie reading. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Apparently Lego was revived briefly in twenty fifteen. Yeah. So it got actually like a short lived T V series that if you go on Netflix you can still find. It's yep. like a two season Netflix show. Mm -hmm. But then the toy line also got killed a second time in twenty sixteen. Jeez keeps on dying and being born and dying and So as it stands right now, Bionicle is dead. There's no yep. more new Bionicle sets <laughs> being made. But they have quite the legacy, and and that was the one thing about the Lego movie I didn't like is how they yeah. kind of like threw a pot shot at Bionicle, being like, oh, and here are some other things we don't have time to talk about. Yeah, that's it's right. like if it weren't for Bionicle, <laughs> this movie wouldn't exist because exactly, the company would yeah. have died. And I, my hope is that if they do make another Lego movie, they'll bring in Bionicle and like be like, yo, like you owe us everything. Y yeah, and and, and you got to wonder, right? Because Lego Movie Two, the second part, from what I remember, I thought it was fine and all, but it did not perform give the same numbers that the first Lego Movie did. So you got to wonder, are they gonna maybe wait before they do another one, or are they just not doing any other Lego movies? Like, uh, I'm I'm not sure. As Aquaman once said, that remains to be seen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any business people out there listening to this episode. Take the story of Bionicle to heart. If your business or your organization is f is failing or is suffering from whatever financial or commercial or critical or spiritual mm -hmm. suffering, maybe take a look at whatever your core values are and ask, is there something here that needs to change? Because if Bionicle taught us anything, is that when it came down to it, Lego realized that they had to change something about their core values essentially mm -hmm. and adapt to the world they were living in and it ended up being successful for them and you know beyond bionicle's dead right now <laughs> might come back who knows yep but there's the moral of the story yeah right <laughs> compromise on your virtues to achieve success yeah <laughs> um it's now time to go into the batch jar and look at our mail so this is from uh, thomas so hey thomas thanks for sending us some mail he says hi I would love to hear you talk about Super Sentai and or <laughs> Power Rangers. Did I say that wrong? It's fine. Just keep going. Oh, I did, didn't I? Of course. <laughs> Was it Sentai? Yeah. <sighs> but just so. keep going. It's fine. If you need any help on the topics, I'll be happy to help out. Sincerely, Thomas. Thanks, man. Much appreciated. Yeah, so Thomas Meehan, it's good to hear from you again. You have an email us in quite a while, so it's glad I'm, I'm glad to hear anyway you're still listening. Yep. <laughs> and yeah, Super Sentai is the Japanese franchise that Power Rangers uses footage from. 
Right. Yes, I've heard of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if everyone wants to go back and listen to episode 24 of the podcast, Asian John and I kind of looked at the Sentai series that the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was based on, and we kind of compared the two stories because actually, surprise, surprise, they're very different. Mm -hmm. Despite having the exact same visuals, yeah. the two stories they created were vastly different from each other. Yeah. And there's like a moment in an episode where Asian John breaks out his guitar and starts singing, and like I'm like geeking out as he's playing the guitar so uh, <laughs> that's it's, great. it's one of my favorite episodes of the show so if anyone wants to go back and check that out i think it's episode 24 right as a power rangers or 25 uh, i can't yeah, remember now okay point is that's out there and uh, it, so have you had you probably since you didn't even say the name properly i'm guessing you have no <laughs> Shut up. i'm sure you have no do you have any experience with super sentai uh, I, I do not have any uh experience with super sentai but <laughs> I do. I Power Rangers is another nostalgic spot for me. When I was a kid, I would watch two shows uh, every every day after school. That would be, um, which one? That would be. Uh, well, actually, no, three. I guess Batman, uh, the the nineteen sixties series with Adam West. I'd watch uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the animated series, and then I would watch Power Rangers. And yeah, I uh, Power Rangers is very uh, nostalgic uh, for me. I love the show. I, I love the movie, even though like, it's one of those like so bad it's good kind of things. But uh, yeah, I was all about the Power Rangers. And I remember as a kid getting uh, myself and my two other siblings at the time, because my fourth and fifth brothers were not born yet, uh, we were all given the five Power Rangers toys. My younger brother got um, Zack the Black Ranger. My older brother, Josh, got the Blue and Red Rangers. So Billy and Jason, I think, were their names. And then I got the Pink and Yellow Rangers. <laughs> Which, on the one hand, I was kind of disappointed about. But you know what? They're all cool at the end of the day. So I, I, I was like, as a kid, I was just like, what? I got the Girl Rangers? But no, I mean, as I've looked on it before, like, it's kind of funny. But I also, like, I still played with them because they were still the Power Rangers. So it was, uh, yeah, I, I grew up on Power Rangers. Now, is that just Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Or did you continue on with the series after that? Yeah, good, good uh, question. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was, was the one it? that I specifically, yeah, it, oh, it was just Morty, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Because I think after that, there was other stuff I was getting interested in at the time. I, I might have seen a little bit of like the other shows here and there because it's that association. It's like, oh, cool, more Power Rangers stuff. But for me, yeah, it was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers that I would watch on TV. And then shortly after the movie came out, I watched that. And then I was uh, haunted in my nightmares by the ooze. Because the ooze in, in the movie just, yeah, freaked me right out. But uh, I still wanted to watch the movie. That's fair. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I watched it from In Space, Power Rangers In Space, yeah. all the way through Power Rangers Wild Force. Right, yeah, so yeah, So that yeah. was a good four or five years that I was watching the show. And yep. that was when they started embracing the concept, not just changing the outfits every year, but changing the cast as well. So right. each, each series kind of had its own flavor to it. Yeah. And I've kind of gone back to it a handful of times. The The newer seasons are on Netflix. So I've like watched it once in a while to like see, like, is it more or less the same as I remember it? And like now understanding yeah. that the Japanese version exists and like seeing like how vastly different and how very similar some of these mm -hmm. shows are, I find that translation process very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can certainly do uh, more episodes on Super Sentai and Power Rangers. Yep. But maybe, Thomas, if you have specific seasons you'd like us to look at, uh, send us another email. Or if anybody else listening wants us to cover a specific Power Rangers season, uh, Time Force is personally my favorite because mm -hmm. uh, it involves time travel and yep. it's just good villains and things like that. Mm -hmm. But And the best sixth ranger there ever was, you know, fight me about it. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll happily uh, re-enter Super Sentai and Power Rangers into the bat jar. Mm -hmm. And there are other emails, but we're going to save those for the future because I never know how often we're going to get messages. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I kind of bank them up. So if you message us this week and you're like, hey, where's my email? Uh, yep. We'll do it next time, I promise. Absolutely. So if you want to be like Thomas and these other people who haven't had their emails read yet, we can tell you how to get a hold of us. So, if you want to contact the show with a question or an idea for an episode, you can send us an email to batjarpodcast at gmail.com or you can tweet us at thebatcookiejar. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, share our posts on Facebook and make sure to like our page because we want everyone to join us inside the bat jar. Which isn't like a bionicle case, but that's okay. Yeah. We also have a YouTube channel, so if you are one of those people who listens to audio podcasts on YouTube, boy, mm. do we got you covered. <laughs> so you can go on there and subscribe, click the notification button, so yep. you can get notified when our episodes go out. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we're not going to go inside the bat jar this week because next week's topic's already been decided. Uh, the Joker movie is coming out. Yes, that's right. But just due to uh, scheduling things, we're not going to be able to see the movie before we re- review it. So, mm-hmm. in honor of the Joker movie, we're actually going to we're going to save the Joker movie uh, for our 150th episode. Mm, yep. Which is coming up uh, in almost actually when we actually get to having our 150th episode, it's also going to be the celebration of our third year anniversary as a podcast. Nice. That's awesome. So yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about the Joker movie, Mm -hmm. but next week uh, in honor of the release of the Joker movie, we're going to do a ranking of all of the movie jokers. Yeah. And there's actually been a, you know, about as almost as many jokers as there have been Batman. So that's right. Yeah. 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 So uh, come back to the bad Shower podcast next week for a kind of comparison and ranking a definitive ranking, a pre walking Phoenix, mm-hmm. a pre walking Phoenix definitive ranking of all the movie Jokers. Yeah. And until that time, I'm Average Joe. I'm Ben the Movie Buff. Catch on the flip side. See you in the next one.